Americans have become accustomed to seasonal reports of tornadoes and hurricanes. For many, the concept of a derecho or straight line windstorm that rivals hurricanes and tornadoes in wind velocity is a rather new concept. However, multiple weak tornadoes can form in a derecho system. On August 10th and 11th, 2020, a Draco system passed through Iowa and other Midwestern states with non-tornadic wind speeds that reached 126 miles per hour. Now, imagine that kind of wind speed in a place that only sees such storms once every 200 years. That's exactly what happened in Great Britain and France on the night of October 15th through 16th, 1987. In its wake, the great storm left 18 people dead in Great Britain and I believe four in France. As noted by a viewer, this storm shares many similarities to America's Great Blizzard of 1888, which I did a video on. So today on The Vantage Point, we're going to pay a visit to 1987 to investigate that storm. I hope you'll join me. The Atlantic Ocean in the summer and early fall of 1987 saw 14 tropical depressions. That number included three Atlantic hurricanes, Arlene, a Category 1, Emily, a Cat 3, and Floyd, a Cat 1. Of those three hurricanes, Emily was the most destructive. She struck Bermuda and the Greater and Lesser Antilles from September 22nd to the 26th. It caused $80 million in damages and killed three people. Floyd developed into a hurricane on October 12th and remained a Category 1 for only a day. Floyd caused about $500,000 in damages as it passed over the Florida Keys and skirted around southeastern Florida and later struck the Bahamas. Fortunately, there were no deaths and noted injuries from Hurricane Floyd. With such activity taking place over the steamy waters of the Atlantic, meteorologists in Great Britain, Ireland, France, Portugal, and Spain were watching closely. For four or five days, weather forecasters in England were concerned that the most recent Atlantic hurricanes were still a threat to Great Britain. By the 15th of October, British forecasters were predicting that the residual effects of Floyd would pass to the south of Great Britain. In a manner that was like the night 1888, not 1988, but the 1888 nor'easter that swamped New England and New York, meteorologists were less concerned about the developments in the Bay of Biscay, or just to the east. That was a situation destined to change. The seasonal temperatures and gentle winds on the afternoon of the 15th reassured meteorologists and forecasters that bad weather would pass to the south of Great Britain. Michael Fish, a forecaster for the BBC, famously told British folks that they should stop worrying about a hurricane. In fact, he said this. Earlier on Tuesday, apparently a woman rang the BBC and said she heard there was a hurricane on the way. Well, if you're watching, don't worry. There isn't. But having said that, the weather will become very windy. But most likely, the strong winds, incidentally, will be drawn over Spain and across into France. Michael Fish and other meteorologists failed to note the developing conditions in the Bay of Biscay. The bay is an interesting body of water. It's an extension of the North Atlantic Ocean. It borders France to the east, Spain to the south, and the Celtic Sea to the north. The southern part is also called the Cantabrian Sea. There are a couple of reasons why the Bay of Biscay is known for stormy seas in the late fall and winter months, which could mask a looming meteorological threat to the United Kingdom and France. First, it's a bay, so surface water circulates in a clockwise fashion around the bay. That circulation tends to help the bay to retain relatively warm waters for a few months longer than would otherwise be the case. Second, the continental shelf that underlies the bay converts long ocean swells into short, choppy waves. Many of the main parts of the bay are on the shallow continental shelf. In the colder months of the year, the large quantity of humidity that enters the atmosphere over the bay produces frequent storm and precipitation events. The bay is known as a dangerous place for ships in the colder months of the year. But it's not all bad news though. Uh, the west coast of France enjoys mild winters and moderate summer temperatures as a result of the Bay of Biscay's presence. As I mentioned a minute ago, those stormy conditions can mask some evil intent that a deep depression or low pressure center poses to points north and east. Still, concerned meteorologists issued a gale force warning at 6.30 a.m. for the English Channel, and just four hours later, while people in southern England were enjoying a mild late morning, the forecast for the Channel was raised to severe gales. Meanwhile, in the middle of the bay around noon, the barometric pressure dropped to 970 millibars as the developing low pressure center gained strength. 
You should note that a typical hurricane produces an average barometric pressure of about 950 millibars, while normal atmospheric uh, barometric pressure at sea level is around 1,013. By 6 p.m., the storm had moved to the northeast about 70 miles and was approaching Brittany, France. The barometer continued to drop. It was then measuring 964 millibars. By 5.30 a.m. on the 16th, the storm was stretched across southern England and extended to Humber Estuary in Yorkshire. Barometric pressure had dropped to 953 millibars during the long, stormy night. On the coast of Brittany near Quimper, a gust reached 119 knots or 136 miles per hour. In English places like Essex, Sussex, Hampshire, and Kent, wind gusts reached 120 miles per hour. Even inland in England, wind gusts exceeded 80 knots or 92 miles per hour. At Gatwick Airport, winds reached 86 knots, which is just under 100 miles per hour. Of course, in storms like this, uh, sustained winds are a particular concern to weather observers. The highest sustained hourly winds were measured at the Royal Sovereign Lighthouse off the coast of East Sussex. The mean velocity of the lighthouse was 75 knots or 86 miles per hour, which places that wind speed in the Category 1 range on the Safer-Simpson hurricane scale. As the storm moved over land, air temperatures rapidly rose. Boats were tossed about like children's toys. At least one ferry was forced ashore. Some 15 million trees were uprooted and many of them fell on homes or across streets. Other falling trees took out power lines, leaving businesses and homes without power for more than 24 hours. In the United Kingdom, 18 people were killed and I believe if I'm correct about this, four people were killed in France. Some observers claim that the loss of life would have been much greater had the storm made landfall during daylight hours. The controversial idea that this was a hurricane, which is bannered about in uh, meteorological circles, is probably not accurate. There was evidence, however, that some of the damage was caused by rotating winds, such as a vortex. As I mentioned earlier, even Draco systems, which are thought to be straight-line winds or storms, can produce tornadoes. British meteorologists, like their American counterparts did after the 1888 great storm that covered New England and New York with up to four feet of snow, learn from their miscalculations. Well, friends, I hope you enjoyed this brief look at the great storm of 1987. If you did, please like, share, and subscribe to the channel. Looking ahead, I hope to do another surname video, that'd be episode 10, before Friday. I look forward to seeing you next time here on The Vantage Point. God bless you and yours. Bye-bye.